outsmart your fat traps. Get the skinny on taking control. Easier ways to eat less, feel fuller longer, and lose weight. Plus, some say it's the most overprescribed drug in America, and 56 million of you could be taking something you don't need. Should you be taking a statin? Coming up next on Dr. Oz. For all of you who wanted to lose weight but think you can't do it, I'm about to introduce you to the Sherlock Holmes of food. His name is Dr. Brian Wansink, and he's dedicated his life to tracking the secrets of skinny people. Today, we'll go behind the scenes at his state-of-the-art food lab where he reveals his secrets to eating less and feeling fuller. He's the superstar scientist on the cutting edge of the food frontier. Are you ready to unlock the mysteries of food? Yeah! Let's start with the magic of package size. Behind closed doors, here at the legendary food and brand lab at Cornell University, Brian Wansink and his students study the mystery of mindless eating. Do you think your tray had anything to do with how many M&Ms you took? And look for the solutions to stop us from overeating. This is a heavy tray, this is a much lighter tray. Heavy trays, you take more food. Now, Dr. Brian Wansink shares the surprising changes that add up to health gains and weight loss. Dr. Brian Wansink is here, so why, why do we overeat? Well, it's not our appetite. I mean, we like to think we're master and commander of our food decisions. We're much more influenced by the things around us in our environment than we are our appetite. I mean, in the last 50 years, what we found is that food's become more affordable. It's like four times more affordable than it was in 1960. It's more available. I mean, we can eat entire meals at gas stations. Right. And it's a lot more attractive. There's 57 versions of any kind of ice cream we would ever want. So Brian's devoted his research to finding easier ways to eat less, and now he's created blueprints to tackle each of the biggest areas he believes are making you fat. We covered the broad categories. Let's start with the first one you mentioned, the kitchen. This Kit is an area where so many of us trip up and fall. Your research shows, if I get this correctly, that there are three foods on our counters right now <laughs> that make our kitchens fat kitchens. Not fat people. Blame your kitchen. Fat kitchens. <laughs> what makes a fat kitchen? Well, so we found that the, the typical person who has potato chips sitting out anywhere on the counter visible is going to weigh about nine pounds more than their neighbor who doesn't. The typical woman who has breakfast cereal sitting on the counter is going to weigh 21 pounds more than oh the neighbor who goodness. doesn't. And maybe less surprising, soda pop, you've had that sitting out anywhere on the counter, you weigh about 25 pounds more, and it doesn't matter whether it's diet or regular. So it's 55 pounds, if I add it up right, related to three foods that make our kitchens fat, thus making us fat. It's crazy, you know, but you can erase eight of those too, because we also found that if somebody had a fruit bowl sitting anywhere in the counter, they weighed eight pounds less than the neighbor next door. I'm buying fruit. Okay, help <laughs> us design a slimmer kitchen. Again, this is about making it easy for you all to do the right thing. Um, and so I, we got a refrigerator here. If you don't mind, we'll open it up. Let's take a look here. And I, I don't have much in there. So explain to me some of the pitfalls, the mistakes that everyone around America is making right now. Well, first seen is first eaten when it comes to most food, whether it be in your refrigerator, your pantry, or your cupboard. So what we want to make sure we see is that the healthiest food is the stuff we see first. Because you're five times more likely to take the first thing you see than the third thing you see. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, a, we're going to take some of these bad boys right here. Mm, oh, that cake. looks good. Doesn't that look good, everybody? <laughs> Chocolate cake. Okay. And we're going to take it not in a see-through bowl. We're going to put it in an opaque bowl. We're going to cover it up. And just camouflage it there. Yeah, right. And then where you do you put it? See it. Let's just, we got to put it in the most inconvenient spot. Let's, uh, let's put it down here in the crisper. We That's it? Put it, you, you, That's uh, it. No one ever looks in the crisper. Exactly! No one goes yeah, there. That's right. It's going to be there forever. <laughs> we're going to forget it's even there. Unhealthy stuff, wrap it up so you can't see it. So the stuff that comes out of the crisper, where do you put that? Well, for example. Take this. Hey, you know what I mean? This is pretty neat. Just put, have fresh cut fruit wrapped up, top shelf. You know, we find for people who have kids that, that simply having cut fruit on the middle shelf where you open it, bam, it's right there. Ended up, uh, it, kids end up eating almost 70% more fruit if you just cut it up. Uh, and, and how about beverages? So Take the, the big bottle of milk. Yeah, there. you only want the, the big, the milk and water is only the big stuff you want. And the thing is, if you're a soda drinker, you know, make the commitment to only have no more than two cans of soda in your refrigerator at any one time. All right, so if we do all this, how many pounds do we save a month? Be roughly two pounds, up to two pounds a month, if you do it every single day. But here's the deal, it's not just 
you and I who benefit, or the person who's in charge of the household, it's the entire family that benefits. All right, so we actually asked one of our audience members, who's here today, Trisha, to play along with us. She's gonna be food scientist for the day. How are you? So we sent Trisha home, it's in her home, to test out this idea. Again, Dr. Wansik, his, his, his pledge to us is that by doing nothing else in terms of controlling our appetite or anything else, but just by packing our fridge differently, we will, each of us in the family ideally, lose two pounds a month for as long as we do this conceptually. Trisha, you organize your fridge. Yes. You have a picture, I understand? Yes. Are you proud of the picture? Should I show it? Yeah. Okay. Oh my goodness. Wow. Well, did it work for you? It did. Um, when I put the fruit up where everyone could see it, the first thing my son went for was the grapes in the morning instead of going for cereal. He went for the grapes and then I could actually keep track of the fruit that they ate because I had it on the two shelves and I knew what they ate at the end of the day. And the cake, which my husband usually eats the cake, nobody goes in the drawers. It's the cake is still in the drawer. Everyone ate what was He'll never up find front. it years from now. <laughs> exactly. Thank you for being part of the experiment with us. All right. The next blueprint is for grocery shopping. Brian says our worst eating habits start in the store. So we followed him to a grocery store to see why and what we could do to avoid the pitfalls. I'm going undercover at the supermarket to uncover how the way you pack your cart could be packing on pounds. Let's go. But first things first, we need to pick our shoppers. Bing. Bang. Boom. Step out of line. Why? Is there a problem? Check your carts. I would definitely say so. All right, so this concept of a skinny cart. Give us a practical way of making it whenever we go grocery shopping. Yeah, well our best and worst eating habits happen in the grocery store, they start here. So one thing we can do is, what's the right amount of fruit and vegetables put in your cart? Eh, nobody knows. We just start throwing random stuff in until it gets full. But a really easy rule of thumb to come up with is to uh, think in terms of half. So divide your cart in half and, and make the rule that, hey look, anything I get, that's a fruit or vegetable, whether it be canned, frozen or fresh, I'm putting it in the front half of the cart, everything else goes in, in the back. And here's kind of the way it happens. Is instead of just loading it up with stuff, you, you kind of go, okay, I got some cereal. Uh, I got some cookies. But all of a sudden, you're seeing a, a big empty spot there, and it's suggesting that, hey, wait a minute, something's missing in my life. So what we find is that people who do this, in some cases, can double the amount of fruits and vegetables they end up buying, because every time they pick something up, they have to say, is it a fruit or vegetable or something else? Yep, it's a visual cue. It's very yeah. smart. All right, last up is when you're eating at a fast food restaurant. This is a cl classic scenario. You're great in your diet, doing everything right, and then you go out with some friends. What's the secret here? You don't control your destiny in the fast food restaurant. <laughs> no, 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 you don't. But what I do is this, this half plate uh, idea. We, we call it the uh, half plate rule in our lab. And uh, one of the things that we found is when we ask people, we say, look, you can eat anything you want, but half your plate always has to be fruits, vegetables, or salad. What we end up finding is that the typical person reports eating about 21% fewer calories in general. Because they can have seconds or thirds or fourths at home. They can eat more at the restaurant, but that's the rule of thumb. So you don't control what the other half is. If you want a pizza yeah. with all the toppings, you get that as long as the other half is what you would believe is healthy foods. Yeah, I think the worst thing you do at restaurants is tell yourself no. Because I mean, nobody goes to a restaurant to start a diet. I love that you bring science to a process that's an enigma to so many of us, and you make it easy for us to do the right thing. Thanks Thank for all you. your work. Thank you. For more of Brian's mindless eating solutions, check out his new book. It's called Slim by Design. It's wonderful. For more tips to eat less and feel full, you can go to DrOz.com. I'll be right back. Coming up, some say it's the most overprescribed drug in America, and 56 million of you could be taking something you don't need. Once hailed as the wonder drug, should you be taking a statin to end heart disease? Coming up next. All new Dr. Oz. New health rules that make life easier. From a simple technique to save your heart, to the new standard to measure obesity. Plus. You have an issue that we need to address. Reality housewife Caroline Manzo gets real about family weight issues. I wasn't that mother that 
would sugarcoat it. Like, I literally was just having a nervous breakdown. Now they took their waistline out of the storyline. All new Dr. Oz. That's tomorrow on Dr. Oz. On the heels of controversial new guidelines that rocked the medical community last year, an estimated 56 million Americans could not be taking statins to ward off heart disease. But now, some doctors say the medication once hailed as a wonder drug may just be the most overprescribed drug in America. First introduced 27 years ago, statins quickly became the superstar of heart attack prevention. The key to their success, these drugs quickly reduce heart-threatening LDL cholesterol and may even boost heart-healthy HDL. Well, statins have become more and more common. They Tens of millions of Americans take the so-called wonder drugs called statins. Statins do such a good job that last year the American Heart Association made headlines when it recommended that anyone with any major risk for heart disease, like high blood pressure or diabetes, should take a statin, even people with normal cholesterol. Assuming doctors follow these recommendations, the number of statin prescriptions could jump by 13 million, making almost half of all American adults aged 40 to 75 eligible to take a statin. But is that really such a good idea? There's a growing debate in the medical community about the potential dangers of using these powerful drugs with potentially powerful side effects as a quick fix for so many patients. The question we ask today, should you be taking a statin? Dr. John Kennedy, a preventive cardiologist who's a member of the American Heart Association and prescribes statins to his patients, is joining me to help discuss this topic. So in your practice, what kind of patient gets handed a statin prescription? So patients with high cholesterol or those with key risk factors like diabetes, high blood pressure, tobacco use, or a family history of premature coronary artery disease, and also patients with known or pre-existing coronary disease or a previous heart attack. So this is actually a departure. You know, given statins to people who have heart problems, had a heart attack, for example, that's been done for years and has a lot of data. But this departure that's getting so many folks onto the bandwagon of statins is about taking people who have no evidence, really, of having active heart disease in yet, anyway, and giving them drugs. Why do you think that makes sense? Well, the best studies that we have are the randomized clinical trials, and they suggest that statins prevent first-time heart attack. Um, I always like to tell my patients that statins work by strengthening the blood vessel wall. Um, I ask them to imagine how when cholesterol is taken up into the blood vessel wall, it weakens it and makes it like a, a weak quality of wood, sort of like particle board, which is very easy to break. When you take a statin, it strengthens the wall and makes it more like a high quality wood, like mahogany or a high quality pine, which is much more difficult to break. So that's why I prescribe statins, because I think they prevent the blood vessel wall from tearing or breaking, which is the ultimate cause of a heart attack. And what about the side effects I keep hearing about? You know, not just muscle aches and pains, but also brain fog, and things that seem pretty far away from what a statin might be doing. Yeah, I think, I think the media sensationalizes and really overestimates the side effects. And in my practice and in, in, you know, what I've experienced is that most of the time it's not from the statin. And so you shouldn't go off of it until you've talked to your doctor. Let me squeeze you if you don't mind. So when you're talking to someone about a statin drug as an option, do you first spend time on lifestyle issues? Absolutely. I think lifestyle issues are probably the most important thing, but I've found that not everybody sticks to it. If I can share a little secret with everybody, the, the, the fundamental problem I see a lot, and I've seen this firsthand, is that a physician who really deeply cares for his patient doesn't trust that you'll take the lifestyle advice and act on it. So let's say, for example, your doctor says your lifestyle's terrible uh, because you're, you're not eating the right foods. And then the question you'd ask is what do I do about that? They might say, well, cut out refined sugars, carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And then you might say, well, okay, do that for three months. So that would allow you to avoid being on a statin. Because I fear that folks are getting a false license, a freedom, a sense of security, mm -hmm. that they don't have to eat well, for example, if they take the statin. Do you see that in your practice? I, I, I do, unfortunately, and I, I wish uh, people wouldn't do that. Um, and anyone that's prescribing a statin really shouldn't be sending that message. The most important message is what I completely agree with you with Dr. Oz, and that is, if you're gonna prescribe a statin, you should also prescribe healthy lifestyle. You should be talking to people about exercising, you know, being physically active regularly, uh, eating right, and also 
producing stress, which is something that I think we tend to ignore. When we're stressed and we race through life at breakneck speed, we have too much to do with too little time, we tend to eat poorly. We grab for comfort foods, we overeat, and we don't exercise. And the worst thing is, is when we get stressed, we tend to self-medicate, right? We drink more and we smoke more, and all those things are bad. If so, if I can just take that as a launching point, because I think it takes a little bit of a broader theme. Let me give you three questions to ask the next time a doctor gives you a statin. The first question is, what are the heart attack risk factors that are putting me at risk? That's important. Secondly, what healthy lifestyle changes can I do about that risk factor? And thirdly, how long do I need to make that change before I need to go on a statin? I think a medication doesn't need to be the first line of defense for something as preventable as heart disease. I don't want you to have this false sense of security that we're discussing just because you're on a statin. So print the questions that I mentioned to you that I want you to ask your doctor. It's on DrOz.com and bring them to your next appointment. Have the conversation with your physician and together you can find a lot more insights about what might be best for you. You can also find a great chapter on statins from Dr. Kennedy's book, The Heart Health Bible. It's on DrOz.com. I'll be right back. Coming up next, is eating yogurt or drinking milk making you feel sour? Are dairy products spoiling your mood? You could be allergic. A four-day elimination diet could provide some clues to curb your dairy dilemma. Next. We are bringing healthy back this season and want you to bring it too. Grab your prescription pad for fun and sign up for free tickets today. You can go to DrOz.com slash tickets and sign up. the phrase milk does a body good but for some people consuming foods like milk and yogurt can cause problems big time problems so you may even wonder if it's an allergy Amanda's joining me you understand I understand I've had some issues with dairy I have Describe I them. have so it just it comes in different forms depending on what I eat it could be anywhere from you know a headache to my skin breaking out rashes or just really severe abdominal pain uh, so it's kind of a bummer I can't put my finger on it uh, it's just I don't alone. feel good. Yeah. There are a lot of women who I say the same things. It's symptoms I wouldn't have expected from there. You just sneak up on me. The question it raises is, is it possibly a true allergy? And how do I know? I don't. You don't? I don't. Right. I'm so happy you came today. Come back. Because a true food allergy is caused by your immune system. Right. It's different from other types of problems you might have with dairy. So let's go over what's going on. Let's say you have a glass of milk and you're drinking it down there. The food goes through your swallowing tube and then happily goes down, once it gets into there, down into the stomach. Right. And once it's in the stomach, it slowly goes into the intestines where it begins to get absorbed. Now here's the action. This is an immune cell. It's waiting there. And these little white particles are dairy that's coming. It touches your immune system, and your immune system doesn't like it. It sends out these red histamines that cause a reaction, an allergic reaction. It makes your heart beat fast, as mm -hmm. much as it can. You'll start to see rashes on the body, especially mm -hmm. places, for example, on the neck. And here's the most important thing. Go down into your lungs, you start to see the lungs will get wet and spastic and they'll close down. That causes problems with breathing. It can also lead to issues like vomiting, inability to swallow, a whole constellation of things that you associate more with typical allergies right. than you would with, with milk. So the question is Like why? outdoor allergies. Like outdoor allergies, for example, or being stung by a bee, which is my allergy. There are mm. many. So do you remember the Little Miss Muppet song? Kind of. It's been a while since I've done my yes. nursery Do you all rice. remember Miss Little Miss Muppet? <laughs> Well, Mrs. Little, Little Miss Muppet sat on a tuppet. Eating her curds and whey. Right. Along came a spider and sat down beside her and scared Miss Muppet away. Yes, you know, off she went. Now, the key part of that, very well done, by the way. Please give her, that's right, she deserves an applause for that. It's hard to do that right <laughs> on national television. So Little Miss Muppet sat on her tuppet eating her curds and whey. Right. The curds and whey are actually the parts of the puzzle here that are interesting. When something, when milk curdles, it gives off a solid component, mm -hmm. right? And that's one of the key proteins that can cause irritation, right. casein is often found in that. You may have heard that word casein. Then whey, curds and whey, yep. the whey is, is also a protein. That's what's left behind the liquid after the milk curdles. So this is what happens when milk goes bad. When milk goes bad, yeah, or when you're making dairy products, it's naturally found in there. Right. But these two proteins, casein and whey, which we use on purpose because they have some benefits, can cause allergies. They can uh, uh, you know, have those immune cell reactions that I showed you in the animation and cause things you never would have expected. But the symptoms can be hard to fine because they're subtle. Their body reacts in different ways. So you want to learn more about this? Absolutely. Because right, I've got a plan that'll help everybody who thinks they may have an issue here. Joining us now is allergist Dr. Clifford Bassett who says he's got a four day elimination diet that can provide clues. Welcome Clifford, how are you? Great to be with you again. This is called a dairy diary, a dairy diary. So, so someone like a man who's having an issue like this, walk us through what they should be doing. Okay, day one, you want to do a diary. You want to jot it down and bring it to your doctor right. and write down what you're feeling. Again, it's very important 
do a body check. It's very important because what happens is you may not realize you may have hives, you may have itchiness associated with eating a food, and by doing a visual inspection, mm -hmm. that's a very telltale sign. The skin can be your friend. It can be an early warning sign if you're having a reaction. I think that's where it is, you, the skin. You get rashes that are mm -hmm. significant? In my back and my neck. Some, similar to what I showed you in the animation? Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest something. Okay, mm -hmm. day two, what do you do? Day two, again, very common foods, dairy, they tell us it's great for our bones, right. but if you have an allergy, you suspect there's a problem. I teach my patients in my office every day to be a label detective. <laughs> Decode labels, as Dr. Oz said, casein, whey protein. In a can of tuna fish, you might have dairy in it. Hot dogs, you may not even realize it. These proteins are ubiquitous, and if you have a cow's milk allergy, or suspect you do, you want to listen to what we have to talk about today to get you through this. Okay. Days three and four of your dairy diary. Day three, we're looking at yogurt, ice cream, cheese sticks, all of these goodies that contain dairy that are problematic if you have a cow's milk allergy. That I really like. That you really like, <laughs> we all like. <laughs> but that's not the tricky one. Day three is sort of obvious. We sort of all know what's in regular dairy. Day four is the hard part. Here's the hard part. Day four, there's a lot of hidden ingredients. And if you've avoided these foods, and you did a good job, you actually may be feeling better and feeling the effects of the elimination. It's very important, you wanna make sure if you have an allergy, you wanna avoid the food and not take a chance, but you wanna also see a specialist, an allergist, who's trained to do the right investigation to keep you out of harm's way. Okay. Can I just give you a little hint? Sure. This is a big issue for a lot of folks. We don't realize how ubiquitous dairy is, how it's hidden in so many foods. So here's some surprising okay. sources. I'm gonna put them up here for you so you can see okay. them. All right, so again, you have you have cold cuts, deli meats, who would have thought? Chocolate, mm. Mm, looks so good, dairy, <laughs> right? You have breads, you have cookies, uh, you've got chewing gum, chewing gum, you know, crackers. Yeah. And here's the part that's most surprising to me, that cosmetic industry actually often uses dairy in some products. Do you, which of these do you use? And please be honest. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the deli meats for sure, the chocolate, um, and the uh, cosmetic products, yeah. I think would be the scariest for me. Who would have thought? I know, so, it's well, everything. Well, it's in a lot of things, and you, now that you know this, and again, allergies are not dependent on how much of something you see. If you see it at all, you could react. So what I want you to do is get your smartphone. Okay. You know in the notes section? Yes. Take this simple dairy diary. Everyone at home, I want you to do the same thing. Simple, easy way to log on what you're, what you're tracking. Uh, make sure you keep track of it just for four days, and after that, you'll have a pretty good clue. <coughs> Dr. Bassett, if all signs point to an allergy, which is what I'm getting the vibe from Amanda on, what tests would, it, would an allergist like you perform? Well, we're... In really empowered to interpret the tests, right. whether it be a blood test or a simple, reliable skin test, a food challenge, and now we have component tests, particularly for cow's milk. We could look at the exact proteins and get a better idea what your risk is and how to deal with it. So it's very important to get the total picture. We call that the food allergy action plan. Confirm the diagnosis, watch the labels, watch for false starts, and also be prepared. Right. Again, an allergic reaction is very serious, and we want to be able to keep people out of harm's way and get them the right education, the right information. Right. I'm sending you off to Dr. Bassett's office. I'm in. Good luck. I'm in. Thank you. You can go to DrOz.com to find all these hidden dairy items I just spoke about and lots more good stuff. We'll be right back. Next, the average person loses 50 to 100 hairs per day. But for some, the amount can be far more hair raising. Don't wig out. Find out the reasons why. Simple solutions to help you treat your hair loss. Coming up. All new Dr. Oz, new health rules that make life easier. From a simple technique to save your heart, to the new standard to measure obesity. Plus, you have an issue that we need to address. Reality housewife Caroline Manzo gets real about family weight issues. I wasn't that mother that would sugarcoat it. I literally was just having a nervous breakdown. Now they took their waistline out of the storyline. All new Dr. Oz. That's tomorrow on Dr. Oz. The average person loses 50 to 100 hairs per day. It's normal. But when you're standing in front of the mirror, combing your hair, and more and more strands end up in the sink, well, you start to worry. Well, no more worrying, because today I'm giving you the best ways to stop down your hair loss. From the latest headline-making treatments to simple solutions we can all do at home today. But before I go any further, I need my assistant of the day. Who wants to play with me? Ah, see, 107, 107. Come on down, you're my assistant of the day, 107. Is anybody? Where are you? Oh, she's up there. There she is. There she is. What's your name? Lisa. Lisa, who are you there with up there? I am with my mother. 
and my husband. Where's your mom? <laughs> my mother's that beautiful That's woman your right mom? there. Yes! You oh want to switch, don't you? No, no, no. <laughs> that is remarkable. Wait, my husband feels a little left out. Oh, husbands. <laughs> husbands. All right, let's talk a little bit. Describe your hair to me. Oof. Well, it's growing out. I've recently had my over 40 hair cut off. Um, I've had a lot of hair loss. It was recently down to here. Oh my. And just after I hit probably mid 30s, I started losing a lot of it. It started, the texture started getting awful. Just not good. Did anything help make it better? Wine. Wine. <laughs> You wouldn't think about it anymore. Right. All right, come on over here, Lisa. We're going to do something. We're going to show everybody why these things start happening at a certain age. And let's just start back with the 20s. When you had right. that hair down to your shoulders you mentioned. Oh, yeah. It was beautiful and sexy, thick. Yeah. Sexy. Did your husband think it was sexy? Yes. I bet he did. Right. <laughs> they, put, they put this on you. Is that, does that fit there? Yeah. OK. Well, that's very becoming. Isn't okay. it? Yes. All right. Now, with that swim cap on, let's put on the wig that represents what your life may have been like when you're in your 20s. Oh boy. Is that about right? Ooh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> the, the softness is, it's beautiful, really. It's soft. Ooh. Yeah, it doesn't quite perfectly, it's, yeah. but it's pretty close. I like it though. Right. You like it because it's full, because it's rich, because you don't have yes. any patches that are missing, et cetera. Okay, let's put that down. Let's take you a decade into the future. Okay. And face me if you don't mind. Put this on the right way. There we are. Now describe. What do you think about that hair? Ooh, it's actually like how I had my hair not so long ago before I even went shorter. Ooh, well, it's, what's this? Yeah, what is this? What is this? Look at that, what is Ooh. that? And there's hairs coming Ew, out. Ew, it's like me, like oh, 10 years ago. This it's, is gross. It's hair coming out, we don't want it. <laughs> all right, not too far off. All right, let's move you past that to the bigger problem. All right. Which is this. This is, I, I know what a lot of folks who are watching right now are struggling with. Oh. Very common, people don't talk about it that much. Now I'll describe what that feels like and looks like. Oh my goodness. Oh, God. Not so good, Dr. Oz. Stuff falling all over. And then, oh. yeah, to describe it to everybody. Oh, oh, oh my God. Oh my goodness. This is horrible. And what if you try to brush it, what happens? Oh. 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 It's just awful. Is that what the brush looks like sometimes? Yes, except black and worse, yeah. Black and Ugh. worse. So what do you do to cover it up? Um, well, you do a lot of uh, combing, thinning, putting products in, and then eventually, I don't know. I, what do you do? Well, let's talk about that. What do you do? I'm glad you came to the show today. We get that gap, especially in the front where the, where the part becomes a little bit more visible. Those are all the subtle early signs, and it gets worse and worse. So you want the cap on or off for the rest oh, of the I show? I like it, but you can take it off. You look so beautiful with your natural hair. I'll keep you there. All right. So lots of exciting headlines about this. In fact, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this today was I saw one recently that really caught me. Uh, it was done by researchers at Columbia University where I practice medicine. This is done, look at this picture, folks. For alopecia sufferers, folks who lost their hair were given a bone marrow drug, and those patients were shown to have near complete hair regrowth after five months of treatment. So the guy in the far left was actually suffering from this in the middle a few months later, and the far right is five months later. I mean, it's really remarkable. I want to keep watching these developments but in the meantime, I want to give you tools to help you fix your hair loss today. The first is, oh, the yeah, these are tools to fix your hair loss right now. Okay. We're going to talk about how we treat our hair. Everyone in the audience, you have pasta. It's a small gift from the show, a token of our love for you. <laughs> All right, I want you everyone to take that little strand of pasta. Here's yours. Thank you. And I want you, this is a strand of hair. Pretend that. I want you to just snap it in the middle. Ooh. See how easily that snapped? Mm. That's how fragile your hair is. This is exactly what happens when you wash and condition your hair with hot water. Hmm. So you can still take a warm shower. I'm okay with okay. that. But when you're done the warm shower, I want you to then put the conditioner on your hair with cold water. Mm -hmm. When you use cold water at the end, you actually seal in the moisture of the hair and that, and that moisturizer as well from the conditioner. And therefore it looks more like this, Ooh. like little capellini. See these yes. nice bendable strands? Mm -hmm. Isn't that nicer to have? It's Yes, much nicer. Much it's nicer. Not breaking. Exactly. So all you got to do again, you can shower warm. Just at the last second, put the conditioner on your head, the normal dollop you put on there. Get out of the the, uh, the warm water. Your body can still be in warm water. Mm -hmm. And when you're done with the hair, just turn the water to cold, rinse it out, and it'll be more like the soft pasta than the, cr the crazy nice. stuff we cracked. Okay, oh, simple cool. little tip. Okay. Have you ever tried something called minoxidil? Never. 
This is over the counter now. These things are inexpensive. There are many brands that make it. This is the raw material. Uh, I gotta say, for women, it has proven benefits. I'm always surprised women don't try this because mm -hmm. it's relatively accessible. It stimulates new hair growth, which is nice. Mm -hmm. It reduces the loss of old hair, and it makes the hair you have thicker, all of which will make your hair look better. And now that it's available over the counter, I think that's worth trying out. You're gonna put about a dime size of the stuff mm -hmm. on, on your palm. You're gonna rub it into your scalp twice a day. And ideally, don't shower anything else two to four hours, within two to four hours of that. So let the stuff actually really? work on your scalp. There's so much information. It actually was first discovered as a side effect because they were giving it to people for blood pressure and they discovered that it actually works for hair gain. So why not take advantage of it? Nice. All right, this is a little gift from me to you. Oh, you know, I have absolute. someone very dear to me who's suffering from hair loss. Right get that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, for seven simple hair loss solutions, go to DrOz.com and we'll be right back. Nicely done. Nicely done. Next, the two words every woman fears, breast cancer. For many, it became a reality. Meet some courageous women who battled breast cancer and won. Their experience will not only inspire you, but may help save your life. Next. Discover your body's true age with Real Age. Take the test and get personalized tips to grow younger. Visit DrOz.com today. You've got to make sure that you know your risk to breast cancer. So in order to do that, you have to make sure that you don't ignore your self-exams. Breast tissue goes all the way up. And sometimes the lymph nodes get swollen and form a mass even before you might notice a lump in the breast. That clip aired in late 2011. And because of it, Erica had a conversation with her doctor that ultimately saved her life. I cannot tell you what a blessing it is to have you on the show, Erica. Thank you for having me. Two years as a survivor. Two and a half. How does it feel? Uh, I, it feels amazing. Um, you know, uh, I, I went through a rough time. You know, I went through the chemo, the radiation, uh, the lumpectomy. And then it sounds cliche and, and crazy, but um, in a way, it's allowed me to do things in my life that I'd never thought I'd, I would do, such as completing a triathlon. So in that way, it's been really empowering. It's not, tr not try to treat cliche at all. I'm so <laughs> proud of you, I can't tell you. How did you discover the lump? Um, I was actually at work in the break room, and I was watching your show. And I said, Erica, you're 30, you're a nurse, and you haven't felt the girls in a long time. So I went home that night and subsequently found it. You did? Mm -hmm. It's pretty scary, I bet. Will you show everybody else how to do it? Because what you did saved your life, literally. Sure. And I love others to do the exact same thing today. Okay. Right, come on over here. Now, <laughs> I've got a little model here. So the first thing, uh, that Erica did, what we all have to be able to do, is start by looking at the breasts in the mirror. Very simple to do. You look for visual changes in, in the size and the shape. Are they symmetrical? Are they, most women have asymmetrical breasts. Are they the normal asymmetrical? Uh, did you see anything different when you looked? I didn't see anything, but I, I felt it. You felt it. Well, actually, show me how you felt. How did you examine your breasts? So I, I took the three pads of my fingers and I kind of went in a circular motion um, throughout the whole breast and I did that on both sides. And then I had remembered that you said, you really need to feel everywhere, so I kind of bent over and, and found, found the lump in my, in my armpit. So when you did feel it, what did it feel like? It was rock hard, like a pebble. So I want everyone, everyone who can hear my voice to do a breast self-exam at the same time each month, ideally one week after your period. Now, our sponsorship partner, Ford, selected Erica as one of their Warriors in Pink Models of Courage, which really is a tribute. So what does that mean to you? It's so fantastic. It really is. Um, it's truly been an honor um, to be on your show and, and to work with the Warriors and Pink team. Um, I was picked uh, I was one out of the 20 co-survivors and survivors to represent Ford's uh, 20th year in the fight against breast cancer. Um, so in, in meeting those, those other 19 survivors and co-survivors has been amazing. They, they also have amazing stories and it's kind of helped me heal through my breast cancer journey. Um, and Ford has allowed me to share my, my story with women in, you know, in a way that is heartfelt and sometimes raw, but I feel like it really hits home and it connects to the everyday woman and the everyday warrior. Um, and I, most importantly, I'm able to share my story with younger women. Um, I was 30 when I got diagnosed. I didn't think that was possible, really. Um, and I think it's a really important 
thing because it's an aspect of breast cancer awareness that I feel is overlooked and, and neglected. Um, and I love the Ford Warrior wear. I'm wearing the 2014 scarf. And the cool thing is if you go to FordCares.com and you pick out your apparel, um, at checkout, you 100% of the net proceeds go to one of four amazing organizations. And so you really have an idea of how you're making a difference and, and where your donation is going. Well, you hit home for me today. Bless you for being here. And I'm, I'm really so happy that it all worked out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Erica. <laughs> now, Erica, fantastic story. But like Erica, there have been many courageous women in the battle against breast cancer. One of them is sitting in our audience. My mother is one of the strongest women I know. She's always thinking of others. For years, my mom worked at a store fitting women for prosthetics that were recovering from breast cancer. When they've lost what makes them feel feminine, she helped make them feel whole again. The last thing I expected was to receive that phone call telling me that she had cancer. This past summer, my mom had surgery to remove her breast, and now she's undergoing chemotherapy. My mom thinks a lot about the women she's known that have fought breast cancer and won. She has such a determined spirit, and I know she's going to beat this. Robin, can you please come up here with your daughter, Raina? Please join me on stage. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And how are you? Good. I don't want to make you all cry. <laughs> how are you feeling, Robin? Today is a good day. I'm so happy to be here. Well, I'm very happy. And I'm here happy to well. be with my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to lie, it's been rough. It's yeah. been rough. You know, these events define our lives. The people in our lives are the ones that are the safety nets. Rena, before your mom's diagnosis, had you guys talked openly about breast cancer? Um, definitely. It's been an awareness since my grandmother had cancer at a really young age. Um, and also my mom doing post-mastectomy fittings. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely something we've talked about, but you never expect to get that phone call. Yeah. No, you don't. That's what today's about. Yes. Phone call comes. It comes when you least expect it. It comes in ways that sometimes are hard to handle. But we have the ability if we can piece it together early enough. Mm -hmm. So this audience, the entire audience, I don't know if folks have noticed, but it's filled with mothers and daughters. Mm -hmm. All. The entire audience. Never done it before. Because I wanted to have women <laughs> in an open conversation about breast cancer. Now, our sponsorship partner, Ford, found that 68% of women believe that the car provides a private setting for important conversations. I just want you guys to talk. And I personally find the car is the best place to do it, and it turns out that's what all the data seems to support. So you must take a car to treatment, I guess. Uh, usually I have someone drive me, but mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, sometimes I do drive myself. A a but usually I have someone drive me. Right. So we actually got a picture of your car. I was curious about it, because you know, yeah. I, I, I'm just curious how you know, people do things in life. So is that, the, is that your car? That's my car. Is it a stick uh, shift? It, it's still, it's stick. Yeah. That must be hard with It's the... hard because my mastectomy was on my right side, so it's, it's a little difficult. I wasn't allowed to drive it for a while. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, thanks to our sponsorship partner, Ford, you are getting a new car today. <laughs> a 2014 Ford Fusion. <laughs> what are you going to talk about in the car? Life. You're gonna talk about life? Yeah. And all the blessings that come with it. Yeah, well let me show you the car because I think it's really cool. <laughs> this is the car that they're giving you. It's beautiful, isn't it? I mean it's unbelievable. <laughs> and that is not all. Ford is giving all of you at home the chance to win a 2014 okay. Ford Fusion 2. You go to doctorize.com slash warriors in pink for more information. I think it's a fantastic car. Oh my God, thank you. Don't thank me, <laughs> thank, thank you Ford. Ford. Yeah, thank Ford. I, 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 listen, I just please remember, if nothing else in today, next time you're in your car, have those conversations. The most important conversations in my life have been in cars. I want you to have yours that way too. Now you can drive around your Ford Fusion doing it right. Wonderful. All right, now that's stated. You'll notice that like Erica, I'm also wearing something pink. I'm wearing yes. my little pink tie today uh, from the Warriors in Pink Apparel line, which is gorgeous. 
I'm doing it because research shows that seeing breast cancer merchandise makes you more proactive about your own breast health. So you can go to DrOz.com, find out how you can support the fight against breast cancer by purchasing Ford Warriors in pink apparel. 100%, every penny of the net proceeds goes to breast cancer charities. It's money well spent. We'll be right back. So happy to see you. Thank you for having me. All new Dr. Oz, new health rules that make life easier. From a simple technique to save your heart, to the new standard to measure obesity. Plus, you have an issue that we need to address. Reality housewife Caroline Manzo gets real about family weight issues. I wasn't that mother that would sugarcoat anything. I literally was just having a nervous breakdown. Now they took their waistline out of the storyline. All new Dr. Oz. That's tomorrow on Dr. Oz. All new Dr. Oz, new health rules that make life easier. From a simple technique to save your heart, to the new standard to measure obesity. Plus, you have an issue that we need to address. Reality housewife Caroline Manzo gets real about family weight issues. I wasn't that mother that would sugarcoat anything. I literally was just having a nervous breakdown. Now they took their waistline out of the storyline. All new Dr. Oz. That's tomorrow on Dr. Oz. It's time for In Case You Missed It. Tons of important, usable information in today's show. One of the biggest secrets to eating less and feeling fuller is to slim down your kitchen and start in your fridge. Here's the example. Eat less by making the bad options invisible. Store them in the produce drawer, for example. And take the produce out of the produce drawer and put them on the center shelf. This is where you put pre-cut fruits and veggies and use a clear wrap or container so you can see everything so it tempts you when you open your refrigerator. And no large bottles of any beverages other than milk or water. If you gotta have soda, which I don't want you to have any, but if you're gonna have soda, no more than two cans inside at a time. You can lose two pounds a month on just these tricks alone. Next, all women should be doing a quick cold water burst at the end of their shower. You can still take a warm shower, I know you're gonna do it anyway, but to stop down the hair loss, you wanna condition your hair with cold water. And here's how. Cold water is gonna help lock in the moisture from the conditioner so your hair won't break as easily. So look at this posture as an example. This hard pasta is what your hair becomes if you're washing your hair in hot water. So when you do anything to it, it begins to break and becomes frizzy. But you want your hair instead to be nice and bendable. When you use conditioner uh, and then add cold water at the end of applying the conditioner to wash it off, it becomes like this more bendable pasta. It won't break nearly as easily. Very simple routine. Make it part of what you do every day in the shower. Now I'm going to close with a warning. I want you to be careful about what you buy online, especially weight loss pills. There's some dubious people online that prey on folks like you who are trying to do the right thing for your health. Sometimes they even try to make it like, see, like I'm trying to endorse their products, and I don't. So to see a full list of our trusted sponsorship partners, you can go to DrOz.com, and I'll see you next time.